<laughs> we got the group shots going on over in the corner here. Oh, that's good. Okay. Um, good evening, everybody, and welcome. Good evening. It's so good to see you. First of all, I'd like to thank you for uh, deferring on this beautiful evening and joining us inside. We opened up the windows so that there's a little fresh air flowing back and forth. Uh, so my name is Bill Clinton. I'm the local Bill Clinton. I'm also a member of this congregation here in media and also the, uh, the president of the board of UU Justice PA. And I'm so glad that you've joined us tonight. Uh, these are, I don't have to tell you, these are very challenging times that we are in. And, you know, the democracy itself is being threatened. So to achieve the beloved community that Martin Luther King envisioned, we need to organize, you're gonna hear this several times tonight, and work together with partner organizations. And this event, I believe, is a major step, or a local strong step, in, uh, in moving in that direction. So UU Justice PA, it's a nonpartisan statewide organization of 35 UU congregations that pursues justice by voting, advocacy, and getting UUs elected to the House and the Senate. We have, we're not there yet. Uh, so uh, when it comes to voting, we are, uh, since uh, 2020, we've been very active as a denomination in a program called UU the Vote, where everybody is organized to get people registered and out to vote. We're not taking partisan positions, we're just pushing voting. The second piece, advocacy. We have, if you've picked up our brochure outside, we have six justice teams that are, that are creating strategies to move the issues that are important to Unitarian Universalists in Harrisburg. So we're not, we don't have a, a statewide or a national focus, it's very much uh, statewide. And then the last thing is, we actually elected a Unitarian Universalist from State College, Paul Takak, who is now a representative. So this event was coordinated uh, by three UU congregations and other area partners, which I'd like to introduce. So the, the congregations are one, the Media UU congregation, and then Mainline Unitarian uh, Church, and that is Pat, and there is Pat. Pat, would you stand up? This is Pat Jordan, and she's the uh, coordinator for the mainline group. And then from uh, Westchester, the Unitarian Congregation of Westchester, the lead organizer is Tom Buglio. Tom, where are you? All right. So Tom not only filled his car, but he brought others. So everybody from Westchester, would you please stand up? <laughs> So let it not be said that Westchester was not in the house. They certainly are. Uh, so HCAN. HCAN is the Havertown Area Community Action Network. And I love this statement. They bring residents of Haverford and surrounding neighborhoods together to promote equity, justice, inclusivity, and democracy. So folks from HCAN, would you stand up? Uh, yay, there they are. And I think they've already taken their own picture. Uh, so um, we are very fortunate uh, tonight to have with us Rabbi Michael Pollack, who's the executive director of March on Harrisburg, and his colleague, Beth Taylor. Beth, would you stand up and give everybody a wave? All right. So as Michael will describe, March on Harrisburg is a nonpartisan, statewide, grassroots community that is reimagining how our democracy operates. All right, so what does that mean? They want, um, they want to, um, they imagine a government that's responsive to the needs of the people and a government that leaves partisan politics, voter suppression, and money interest in the past 
out of the, uh, the, 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 the vision that they have for themselves. So that is March on Harrisburg, and that's why we're excited to have them as a partner. So I met Michael Pollack seven years ago in the spring of uh, 2016, if you can think back that far. This was before Trump was elected in November. And uh, we were both involved in an action called Democracy Spring. And that began, and it be Democracy Spring began with, you ready for this, a 140 mile march or hike or walk from Philadelphia to DC. And when we got to DC, there was civil disobedience that got a lot of us um, uh, put in jail. All right, so Michael was a marcher and I was organizing this community and other UU communities along the way to provide what? Housing and food and feeding people, which are very necessary when you're marching. Uh, so the, it was a total of six days that we were together as a community. And it was very transforming for many of us. And I think we are very fortunate that Michael and March on Harrisburg has not stopped marching. With others, he has created in 2017, so this goes back six years, March on Harrisburg, that works for government, for a government that is responsive to the needs of the people, which is critical. So March on Harrisburg is a critical partner to UU Justice PA, and we're excited to bring both of our message to you tonight. So the goal of tonight is to learn about how corruption works in Harrisburg and how, working together, we can change that. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Rabbi Michael Pollack. Thank you all so much for being here. It is so good to be back in this room, in this space with you all. Uh, I believe we were here five years ago, was the last time pre-pandemic, when we did a barnstorming tour similar to this one all across Pennsylvania. So my name is Michael Pollack. Uh, we are March on Harrisburg. Um, let's go to the next slide. So who we are. We are a statewide, volunteer-driven, nonpartisan, anti-corruption, pro-democracy movement. We fight to make corruption illegal and build a democracy where we can all thrive. Over the last six years, we have marched 298 miles, uh, twice from Philadelphia to Harrisburg, once from York, once from Lancaster. We have lobbied our 253 state legislators many times over. We have conducted over 35 nonviolent direct actions, and we have engaged in moral fusion organizing across the state, especially with our partners in UU Justice PA. Um, and uh, we'll talk a lot more about that later too. Let's keep going. We have helped over the years. We have helped to force five committee hearings on gerrymandering. We helped move open primaries through the full Senate. We helped pass vote by mail and shorten the registration deadline from 30 days to 15 days. And we have moved the gift ban out of its committee twice. Those are our legislative accomplishments. This is a slide just to build some credibility here. It's a little awkward, but here we go. When we fight against corruption and we fight for democracy, we know what we're up against. The former Speaker of the House's Chief of Staff once said to me, you all may be marching on Harrisburg to pass the gift ban, but do you know who's marching on Harrisburg to stop it? Every single lobbyist in this city. We know what we're up against. The forces of corruption have called us things like moronic, spoiled two-year-olds. Back in September, this uh, uh, overheard in the elevator was, oh no, those disgusting people are back. <laughs> the uh, prominent mega lobbyist has nicknamed me the rabid rabbi, and the uh, current House Majority Leader once called me a militant Hebrew school teacher. When March on Harrisburg is in the Capitol engaging in nonviolence, the entire Senate gets a text in the morning letting them know that we're there. The House uses their secret tunnels and passageways to avoid us, and the police section us off inside of the building. We know what we're up against. We're up against a system of entrenched corruption. 
And frankly, their boos mean nothing, as the cartoon here shows, because we've seen what makes them cheer. And that would be power, greed, money, corruption. And that's what we're there to dismantle. We're here to tell the truth tonight. It's not a pretty truth. I want everybody to brace themselves for that. This is not a pretty truth. Right, as Howard Zinn said, the most revolutionary act one can engage in is to tell the truth. And so we're going to show tonight how private money is translated into public power and how public power is then used to make more money for private profiteers while everyone suffers. We're then going to discuss the work of March on Harrisburg and how to jump in and join the movement, how to join UU Justice PA and how to jump into the movement for democracy and how to fight until we have a government of, by, and for the people. We want you to learn tonight, and you're going to learn a lot about systemic corruption and subversion of democracy. But, and you're probably also gonna get angry. You might get disillusioned, you might get bewildered, there might be an anger in your stomach, a, a, a butterflies in your stomach, a pit, but that's not enough. As Dr. King said, history has taught it is not enough for people to be angry. The supreme task is to organize and unite people so that our anger becomes a transforming force. This is an organizing tour tonight. This is an organizing event. We're here to get to work. It's not enough to be angry. I can assume based on polling that most of us are already quite angry. We're here to get organized and get to work. So let's go back a couple hundred years here and start back in 1794. Corruption has been with us in Pennsylvania for quite some time. It gets better, it gets worse, there's ups, there's downs, but it's been with us for a while. Alexander Hamilton in 1794 had a particularly upsetting experience in Philadelphia, and he wrote this in his diary that night. The political putrefaction of Pennsylvania politics is greater than I had any idea of. Do y'all know what putrefaction is? We did an event for some college kids yesterday. We had to define the term. The rotting corpse, the decaying corpse. Right? That's, that's the image that Hamilton was left with. So on this next slide here, we're going to see a, a statue of Boise Penrose. You can see the Capitol building in the background there. This is uh, the statue that sits at the corner of the Capitol complex in Harrisburg, right on uh, where you get to Strawberry Square Mall. Boise Penrose was a U.S. Senator. He was a Pennsylvania political machine boss around the turn of the last century, over 100 years ago. Everything in Pennsylvania went through him for a couple decades, and he was an enemy of the working class. He was an enemy of black people. He was an enemy of immigrants. He was an enemy of Jewish people. He was an enemy of women. He was an enemy of everybody except for his oligarch campaign donors, his robber baron bosses, the J.P. Morgans, the Carnegies of his day. The joke about this statue is actually this is the only time his hand was ever in his own pocket. <laughs> So he once said to his uh, robber baron campaign donors, this quote that's written up there, he said, I believe in the division of labor. You send us to Congress, we pass laws under which you make money. And out of your profits, you further contribute to our campaign funds to send us back again to pass more laws to enable you to make more money. Money in politics is how people with money buy the political power they need to pass laws to make themselves more money. And that is the definition of corruption. That interaction between private money and public power is corruption. Corruption creates close relationships of dependence between obscenely rich people and corporations and our public elected officials. And by the way, I just want to preface, when I'm talking about money and politics tonight, we're not talking about 30 people getting together in a living room with a couple hundred dollars each. We're talking about billionaires like Jeffrey Yass cutting seven-figure checks. That's what we're talking about tonight. And let's take a step back before we keep going again here and just note every human being is capable of what we're talking about tonight. Every human being is capable of greed and corruption. 
What we're talking about tonight is not one party, one politician, one region, one group of people or group of politicians. We're talking about the swamp. We're talking about the system. We're talking about the water that we all swim in. The water that we all swim in. So let's get into the five easy ways to bribe a legislator. Buying a legislator is a lot like buying a Rolls Royce. If you have the money to do it, you can do it. If you don't have the money to do it, you can't. So these are five easy ways to buy a state legislator, to get money to a state legislator. None of these are loopholes. These are the law. None of these are scandals. These are routine. None of these are things that happen once every 10 years and somebody goes to jail for it. No, these are things happening every single day, day in and day out. Gifts, campaign contributions, revolving door, side jobs, dark money. Let's go into gifts. So let's start with the gifts here. In Pennsylvania, it is legal to give any gift to a state legislator. Period, full stop, anything. Cash, vacations, whining and dining, concert and sports tickets. At every Super Bowl, you'll see some legislators. At every Eagles game up in the box, you'll see some legislators. You'll see a few on the sidelines. If you go to a Beyonce concert, you'll see a few in the front row. If you go to any restaurant in Harrisburg on a session night, you'll see them just packed, packed with legislators. Gifts are legal. The legal definition of lobbying in our state includes giving gifts to influence public officials. This is the legal definition of lobbying. Providing any gift, hospitality, transportation, or lodging to a state official or employee for the purpose of advancing the interest of the lobbyist or principal. In plain English, that's called a bribe. The word bribe exists in the English language to describe just that. Giving a gift to a public official to influence them is bribery. That's what a bribe is. And we don't really have a complete picture of the gift economy in Harrisburg. Over 97% of all gifts go unreported and our reporting system is just completely broken. Our 253 state legislators report receiving only about $40,000 a year in gifts. That's what our legislators report receiving. Lobbyists report giving legislators over $1.5 million a year in gifts. And we know from testimony in, in committee, and also the lobbyists like to brag to me in the cafeteria, about how they can get around the reporting thresholds. Uh, it's very easy for them to evade reporting on their end too. So all we know is the number is definitely over 1.5 million a year. Out of that 40,000 number, we got some rare glimpses into uh, specific gifts. And so these are just a few from last year. Our Senate president went to the symphony in Austria. Our House Majority Leader went to the rodeo in Wyoming. And those are really the two big ones that came through in that 40,000 number, because most of them we just don't know. And by the way, he went to the rodeo in Wyoming with the uh, gambling companies. And uh, I think six or seven of them total went, went out there for that trip. Campaign contributions. Okay, this is an honest, harsh truth in our system. It takes money to run for office. That's just a fact of life. At a minimum, you have to print some literature, hire a basic campaign staff, knock a whole bunch of doors. It's gonna cost some money to run for office. If you can raise a whole lot of money, you get an extremely big advantage. You can blanket the airwaves, you can send mailers into everybody's mailbox, you can hire canvassers to come in from all over the country even, to knock doors for you. I live in South Philly, we had canvassers coming in from Florida for a mayoral race. We had two millionaire candidates. That was one thing they did was they just put out a call for workers and, and uh, drove people down to just knock doors for a couple months, right? With big money, you have a huge advantage. And so these are the ranges of cost to run for these offices. To run for state rep, you're looking at tens of thousands to millions. State senator, you're looking at hundreds of thousands to millions. US, uh, sorry, governor, millions to tens of millions. U.S. congressman, millions to tens of millions. U.S. senator, tens of millions to hundreds of millions. 
And if you want to be president of these United States of America, billions, cost billions. So where does that money come from? The big money comes from big money donors, billionaires, mega millionaires. And they give that money through conduits that are called lobbyists. Lobbyists is just a fancy word for a paid advocate. That's what they are. They're somebody you hire to argue your case, you pay them money, and they serve as a conduit for money in politics. So this often happens at these big money fundraisers in Harrisburg. These fundraisers are a constant. They are a constant. That one on the top left, that was a breakfast fundraiser a couple months ago. That was Senator Regan. Uh, cost $1,000 to get in, to drink some mimosas with the senator before they go to work. Uh, that day, there were 11 fundraisers uh, in, in Harrisburg, 11 fundraisers. Uh, we, when we marched in last September, that whole week when we were trying to push the gift ban over the finish line, they took 17 total votes and held 20 total fundraisers. Fundraisers are a time-consuming activity. And so you go behind closed doors, that one in the middle there, that was a breakfast fundraiser for the House Majority Leader, $1,000 to get in. Top right there, that's another $1,000 uh, a plate lunch fundraiser. The bottom left, that was a golf course fundraiser, cost $10,000 to sponsor that one. Uh, bottom right, we'll talk about that one later. That's a fun one. So these fundraisers, this is where our modern day robber barons and their lobbyists uh, give the money over to our legislators. And again, we're not talking about small or mid-level fundraising here, we're talking about big money fundraising. We're talking about thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions. Let's go to the next slide, please. So this is a video here. We're going to talk about. Uh, we're going to hear um, an expert testimony here. This is a young uh, Joseph R. Biden. This is from 1974 when he was a first-term U.S. senator, and this was back when TV used to have programs where you would learn things, and <laughs> it was great. And so this is a public access debate show about campaign finance reform right after Watergate happened system does produce corruption, and, and I think implicit in the system is corruption, when in fact, whether or not you can run for public office, and it costs a great deal of money to run for the United States Senate, even from a small state like Delaware, uh, you have to go to those people who have money, and they always want something. Well, I wonder whether you would feel that there's some virtue in forcing candidates to go out and try to raise money. I've heard people, probably people who didn't run for office, say that it's uplifting to go out and try to get money. Do you think that there's something unuplifting about putting a limit to how much you can ask one man to give you? I think it's the most degrading experience in the world to have to go out and ask for money because you know that unless you accidentally agree with the position taken by the person or group that has the money, that you run the risk of deciding whether or not you're going to prostitute yourself to give the answer you know they want to hear in order to get funded to run for that office. And uh, it's coincidental in many instances uh, when in fact you happen to agree with where they are. And you run the risk, by the way, of rationalizing, of saying, well, if I compromise on this one, give them one, I get 90% of what I want and I don't have to give in too much. So you Later in that interview, just a side note here, he talks about... Um, he says, the kids today, they use this language, uh, ripping off, you're ripping someone off. I think that the American public rip off the politicians by making us run for office this way. In Pennsylvania, there is no limit on campaign contributions. To the state level, you can cut whatever check you want to cut to whomever you want to cut it to. State Senate, state representative, governor, state level, no campaign contribution limits. A, uh, a state legislative candidate from the last cycle, he told me early in his campaign he got a call and the voice on the other end of the line was representing a billionaire, Jeffrey Yass. And the voice said, I will give $300,000 to your campaign if you come out as anti-union and anti-public school. And this guy said, no. And he hung up and he lost. And if he had said yes, he'd be in Harrisburg right now. Our campaign finance system makes you make deals with the devil. It makes people compromise their public service on behalf of private gain. The third corruption we're gonna talk about tonight is the revolving door. 
The revolving door is when people in public service spin through the revolving door and end up working for private industry. Our lo lobbying firms in Harrisburg and in DC and all over are full of former state officials, full of former public officials and their staff. This is a clip right here uh, from Jack Abramoff. Some of you might remember him about 20 years or so ago. He was a mega lobbyist in DC. He pissed off John McCain and went to jail for a few years. This is him on 60 Minutes talking about how effective the revolving door is. And by the way, that was, I'm sorry, that was just a side remark there. When people go to jail for corruption, it's often they're doing what everyone else is doing, but they went after the wrong big person. And so Abramoff went after McCain, that was his downfall. But this is him explaining how the revolving door works. But the best way to get a congressional office to do his bidding, he says, was to offer a staffer a job that could triple his salary. When we would become friendly with an office and they were important to us and the chief of staff was a competent person, uh, I would say, or my staff would say to him or her at some point, you know, when you're done working on the Hill, we'd very much like you to consider coming to work for us. Now, the moment I said that to them, or any of our staff said that to them, that was it. We owned them. And what does that mean? Every request from our office, every request of our clients, everything that we want, they're going to do. And not only that, they're going to think of things we can't think of to do. Jack the revolving door spins dizzyingly quickly in Harrisburg. It's been so fast. On the next slide, we're gonna see a couple examples here. Uh, our last governor's chief of staff resigned abruptly to become a lobbyist for Amazon. Our last governor's uh, acting health secretary resigned abruptly to become a lobbyist for UPMC. Who were they working for when they were public servants? Raises the question. With the gift ban bill, which we're gonna talk about later, we saw the revolving door in action. We saw its effects in a really harsh way back in 2019 when it came up for its first committee vote. That day in committee, a representative named Matt Gobbler showed up with an amendment. We called it the Gobbler Amendment. We'd never seen it before. It came up and it passed all within about 90 seconds. It happened very fast. That amendment severely weakened that gift ban bill. A couple months later, that representative, who's my age, he's a young guy, resigns abruptly and becomes a lobbyist for one of the biggest industries in Pennsylvania, the paper products industry. When he crippled the gift ban that way, who was he working for? Was he a public servant or was he auditioning for his next job? But you may be saying, if you're a legislator, why do you have to wait to get that private industry job. Why do you have to wait to go work for the special interests? You don't. Even though we have a full-time state legislature, starting salary over $100,000 a year, incredible health benefits, incredible pension, great per diems, you get a state car. Even with that, you're allowed to have what's called a side job. And our legislators, a lot of them have side jobs that have obvious conflicts of interest, blatant conflicts of interest. So you'll see on the top left there, that's our old Senate President, Jake Corman. That's his office there in Center County being stalked by vultures. Uh, they, are, they are there for the putrefaction of Pennsylvania politics. <laughs> While he was Senate President, he was on the board of Old Dominion Bank. While he was Senate President, he was a board member of a bank. He's in charge of our budget, and he's a board member of a bank. Bottom right there, you see Speaker Mike Terzai, former Speaker Mike Terzai. That was right after he had reached for the megaphone and Selba uh, put it right behind their head. And it's, it's really funny to see a politician reach for a megaphone and not get it. They're really not used to that. Um, it, it really kind of breaks their brain a little bit. Uh, while he was Speaker of the House, he was a practicing attorney at a law firm that represented Fortune 500 corporations. He was a practicing lawyer drawing a paycheck from a high-powered corporate law firm in Pittsburgh while he was Speaker of the House. Top right, Gene Yaw. Gene Yaw is currently the chair of the Senate Environmental and Energy Resources Committee. He is in charge of the environment in Pennsylvania. He is also a practicing attorney for gas companies. He is both the chair of the Senate Environmental Committee and a practicing attorney for gas companies side by side, draws a paycheck for both. 
That picture is from last June when some of our folks confronted Gene Yaw in his Harrisburg office and gave him a decision to make, either resign as the chair of the Senate Environmental Committee or resign as a practicing attorney for gas companies. He chose to hide behind police and had eight of our folks arrested for having the audacity to pose the question to him. The fifth way that we're going to talk about tonight is dark money, and we really don't have much to say about it, because we don't know. It's money that exists in the shadows. There's no light shined onto it. It's that, yeah. Dark money is not traceable. We don't know where it comes from. We don't really know how much of it is out there. We don't really know what it's doing. We see its effects every once in a while. Have you all ever gotten uh, those mailers in the mail three days before an election that say something like, um, this candidate is the worst person in the entire world. They've kicked puppies their whole life, paid for by Pennsylvanians for a better Pennsylvania. Yeah. I'm, I'm in South Philly. Uh, we just had a mayoral race. Um, my mailbox actually got so stuffed with those mailers that the mail couldn't be delivered, the other mail. It, it got backed up a day. Right, those mailers that come in, that's usually dark money. And as uh, campaign finance expert Craig Holman says, dark money is the ideal cloak and dagger cover when no one knows where the money is coming from or where it is going. And that's really a, a result of the 2010 Citizens United case, which I'm sure a lot of people have heard of, when our US Supreme Court, which has its own corruption issues thoroughly, uh, they decided that money is speech and corporations are people which gives corporations the First Amendment right to speak freely with their money. It's a roundabout way of saying bribery. It's quite clever, the, uh, the, the logic that they employ. So gifts, campaign contributions, future revolving door jobs, side jobs, dark money, and more. All of this adds up to a government that is dominated by and responsive to large corporate special interests. That's who has a seat at the table. And when corruption is systemic, our public officials become employees of big business, and we all suffer from that. So let's take a look at three ways that, that we suffer from corruption here. Healthcare, ecological devastation, and taxes. Pennsylvania healthcare. Our healthcare system is broken. We pay too much, we don't get proper care, we suffer. We have horrible medical debt, a lot of people who are lacking insurance or insurance that is way too expensive to use. We have a lack of health care providers, especially mental health care providers. We have hospitals that are closing down across the state due to greed. There's one around here, isn't there? Or Chester County? There's one closing right now. In Philly, where I am, uh, we lost Hahnemann a couple years ago. And this is a trend across the state. I think we're over 15 hospitals in the last six or seven years now. We also have the eighth highest overdose mortality rate in the country, with over 5,100 Pennsylvanians dying every year from diseases of despair. We also average 82 opioid lobbyists a year in our state capital. That's the highest concentration of opioid lobbyists in any state capital in the country. 82 a year is our average. A 2021 study found that one in two Pennsylvanians delay or avoid medical care because of cost. And 10.5% of Pennsylvanians have medical debt currently sitting in collections. And UPMC, the largest health system in the state, spends over a million dollars a year just on lobbying expenses. And our last health secretary is currently their top lobbyist who in city and state's Power 100 rankings just this week, I believe she was number three in the state. Number two in the state's coming later in the presentation. We also have right now 1.2 million Pennsylvanians at risk of losing Medicaid coverage as we unwind, what a horrible word, the unwinding of the pandemic protections as that can, is carried out. And then on the next slide, we're gonna see a parking spot. This is a parking spot across the street from the state capitol in the parking garage where lobbyists park. It's a great parking garage. And this one is reserved for the Ridge Policy Group. Do y'all remember our governor, Tom Ridge? He spun through that revolving door. He now runs a lobbying firm. They do a lot of lobbying for uh, the healthcare industry, uh, especially big pharma. They also lobby on other things that uh, ruling class special interests care about, uh, gas, wages, those kinds of things. So corruption also causes ecological devastation. 
We poison our air, we poison our land, we poison our water. We were just in Lancaster uh, on Saturday, which is the fourth worst air quality in the country as a county, most of that from agriculture. We poison our air, we poison our land, we poison our water. We have numerous cancer clusters across the state. Our air quality is dangerous. In North Philly now, one in three kids has asthma. Our disease rates are high. Access to clean water and food is a, a struggle in many parts of the state. And as a state, we produce 1% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. 1% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions come out of the ground in Pennsylvania. That research was actually done by a state rep from around here, Greg Vitale, put that uh, research together a few years ago. And the gas industry gives five to nine million dollars a year in campaign contributions, and they spend about that same amount in lobbying, including the unlimited bribes that are gifts. There are 203 registered lobbyists for the gas industry. There are 203 state representatives. This is the parking spot of the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. They are one of the main blue-blooded, uh, uh, ancient, going back well over 100 years, fossil fuel uh, lobbying firms. They promote fossil fuel development. They push it as hard as anybody else. When we force the encounter with corruption, we generally run into them. They're generally right there in the room, always. Uh, when we disrupted the former House Majority Leader's Press Club event in 2022, uh, David Taylor was there, and this is just a quote that I, I just, it cracks me up a little bit. This was uh, from that day. Dave Taylor, President and uh, CEO of Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association, was even more direct. He, this is what he, he yelled at us. It's not about you, expletive deleted. This is a public forum. Show some expletive respect. This is as he's sitting next to the House Majority Leader, who he has a standing weekly lunch with at an event where we've been trying to meet with again. Uh, PMA, they do a whole lot of uh, uh, fossil fuel development. Um, and then these, these last two quotes there on this screen uh, are from when we disrupted the Pennsylvania Society back in December. Has anyone ever heard those, that word, the Pennsylvania Society? Then, yeah. It is a, what a ritual, what a custom, what a tradition. Basically in the 1890s, the robber barons got tired of checking up on their investments in Harrisburg. So every year in December, Pennsylvania's political elite go up to Manhattan for a three-day bribery fest. It's full of fundraisers, it's full of luncheons and brunches and going out to the bar and happy hours and it's just a three-day good time up in the city. And PMA holds one of the uh, big events every year. They, they host one of the big ones. We crashed that back in December. We forced the encounter with corruption. And in the paper, his quote was, you know, it included, it's where our most prominent elected officials speak to a VIP audience at length. Right? That's the kind of forum control, setting control these folks have. They build the structure where everyone comes in, industry gets to sit down with elected officials and have a nice civil conversation where they can get on the same page. And lastly, let's talk about taxes. Oh, it's May 18th, one month ago was tax day. Are people still feeling the sting? Taxes. In Pennsylvania, Let's start with individuals. In Pennsylvania, the top 1% pays a 6% tax rate on all state and municipal taxes as a share of family income. All state and municipal taxes as a percentage of family income, the 1%, top 1% pays a 6% effective rate. So that's everything sales tax, property taxes, every state and local tax together. The bottom 20% pays a 13.8% tax rate. We have a regressive backwards tax structure. How does this happen? The most important thing to all special interests is the tax code. That's what they zero in on. All those loopholes, all those carve outs, all those exceptions, that's what they fight for. That's the big prize is the tax code. And when it comes to business taxes, 70% of large corporations in Pennsylvania avoid taxes by being legally registered in Delaware. You don't have to go to the Cayman Islands anymore. Delaware is right there. It's just as, e it's far easier. 
And if you ever go to Wilmington and you go to the, the city center, the, their city hall, there's the big post office building is right there. And you can see the big wall of P.O. boxes. And you can see Coca-Cola, Comcast, Independence Blue Cross, Exxon, Shell, et cetera. That's where they're headquartered, on paper. It's a one mailbox in downtown Wilmington. It's a tax dodge. So our unfair and asinine tax system, it contributes to worsening income inequality, it contributes to the, uh, grows the racial wealth gap, it makes poor people poorer and rich people richer. And then at the end of the day, there's just never enough money for education. There's just no money in the budget for gun violence prevention programs. There's just no money in the budget for infrastructure. There's just no money in the budget for health care. There's just no money in the budget for things that people actually need. And so speaking of giant corporations that don't pay taxes, this is Comcast's parking spot across the street from the state capitol. So we are all being governed by absurdity. We're being governed by absurdity. Our government is corrupted by big money special interests and we all suffer from that corruption. We all suffer from that corruption. And this is something that I think we all already know. I probably have given some new information, some new details, but as far as the general feeling, I'm pretty sure most people here walked into this room tonight. If I were to ask you the question, do you trust your government to do the right thing? I don't think you would have given a resounding yes. And polling backs that up again and again and again. According to a Franklin and Marshall poll, only 11% of Pennsylvanians think that there is little corruption in government. I think those 11% work in the Capitol. Because <laughs> I've never met anybody. <laughs> so, we don't trust our government here in Pennsylvania, and nationally we also don't trust our government. That chart on the left is a Pew poll. They've been asking this question for a long time. Do you trust your government to do the right thing all or most of the time? It's about 15 to 20 percent nationwide trust our government. About 15 to 20 percent. That's where the number is. Now the chart on the right, though, shows congressional re-election rates. And you'll see those are well over 90 percent. So this raises an obvious contradiction here. We don't trust them, and yet they keep getting reelected. They don't solve our problems, and yet they keep coming back to work. They consistently fail us. We know they're failing us. We know they're working for special interests. We know they're working for oligarchs and billionaires. And yet we keep sending them back again and again and again. How does this happen? How does this contradiction exist? Why can't we fire the people who fail us so consistently? Right? Why, why are we seem so stuck in this? Let's keep going. So our system is fueled by corrupt money. Right? That's that Boise Penrose quote from way back when. I give you money, you pass laws to make us more money. We give you more money, you pass more laws. That's the driver of the system. To keep that graft going, to keep people from joining together and storming the castle, you have to divide and conquer. You have to divide and conquer. And it's everywhere in our society. So this is a famous political cartoon. It makes the rounds pretty regularly. Um, it's a, a bunch of people storming the castle, the working class standing outside with pitchforks and torches, and the king is standing there looking a little worried, and the advisor says to the king, don't worry, you don't need to fight them. You just need to convince the pitchfork people that the torch people want to take away their pitchforks. That's our system. And so we the people are constantly frustrated at the ballot box by limited choices that are far too often meaningless. Not all meaningless, but far too often meaningless. And we end up being governed institutionally by corrupted hyperpartisans who rarely even represent a majority of voters. Let's dive into that. These are three ways that we are structurally divided and conquered. These are structures. These aren't one-offs. This isn't something that happened once, right? These aren't loopholes. These aren't rare. This is the structures. This is what's built in. Gerrymandering, closed primaries, winner-takes-all elections. 
These three things, plus the influence of big money, divide and conquer Pennsylvanians, subvert democracy, extinguish accountability, and allow for the theft and oppression to continue. Raise your hand if you know what gerrymandering is. Okay, we'll breeze through this section. Let's go to the next slide, please. So gerrymandering, of course, as many of you know, it's when politicians pick their own voters. It's when politicians draw their district lines. In Pennsylvania, the state legislative districts are drawn by the leaders in both parties and both chambers with the tie-breaking vote coming from the state Supreme Court. And we have in Pennsylvania 228 legislative elections every two years. 203 state representatives are running every two years. And then our 50 senators, they serve four-year terms, so half of them are on the ballot every two years. 228 general elections happening for our state legislature every two years. That bottom right number, 2022 total, how many do you think were within 10 points? How many of the 228 general elections were within 10 points, somewhat competitive? Anybody want to guess a number? Uh, <laughs> All here. 21. Let's go to the next slide, please. 21. 21 out of our 228 general elections were competitive. Only 9% were competitive. How many of those were here? Six, seven, five, four, somewhere in there. All right. Because what we live in, in economic terms, is a cartel setup. A cartel is when two firms divide turf between each other, refuse to compete on each other's turf, and then battle ferociously in the buffer zone, in the middle ground. Delaware County is a buffer zone. This is an area where people pour tons of money into elections. Tons of attention comes down on, on Delaware County. What are the other buffer zones in our state? Lehigh Valley has a few. Dauphin County has a few. That's it. Sometimes the suburbs of Allegheny County, the suburbs of Pittsburgh are, are a, a buffer zone, but that's kind of it. Everywhere else in the state, general election is non-competitive. It's, it's a built-in advantage. And so gerrymandering lets powerful legislators and party bosses protect themselves and each other. It makes most of our general elections predetermined and meaningless. And so that makes primary elections all the more important, right? If the general election is built-in non-competitive advantage for one party over the other, the primary becomes extremely important a lot of the time. So let's go to closed primaries. Right, in Pennsylvania, we have closed primaries. If you're not registered with one of the two major parties, you don't get to participate in that party's primary. Most states have open primaries. We're one of about a dozen, I wanna say, I'm going to get this number wrong, 11 or 14 uh, total. Uh, 1.23 million Pennsylvanians are registered independents or third-party members. That's 14% of the public, and they are not allowed to participate in what is often the only election that matters in their district, the primary. Now, we know that that 14% number is an undercount. If you look at independent uh, polling across the country of, of how do people identify, Republican, Democrat, independent, green, libertarian, something else, well over 40% of people in this country identify as independents. In states that have open primaries like Alaska, the independent rate goes up as high as 55%. Our 14% number is because a lot of us feel like we have to register with the party in order to have a vote that actually counts. A lot of us are very frustrated. Our system discourages independents and third party members by locking them out of the all important primaries. It's not a good setup. So let's go into winner takes all voting here. Because it isn't just who votes that matters. How we vote matters a lot. And the way we vote right now makes no sense whatsoever. And we'll make that very clear. In most places in the United States, the way we vote right now, including everywhere in Pennsylvania, is that you go in and we have a winner takes all uh, election. You say, this is my number, this is my choice. This is who I'm voting for. And whoever gets the most votes wins. You don't need a majority of votes to win. 
You do not need a majority of votes to win an election. And oftentimes, in, most, in a lot of races, you don't get a majority of votes. Go on. So there's many downsides to the way we vote right now. One of them is called lesser of two evils voting. Suppose there are three or more candidates on the ballot and a voter's preferred candidate has no chance of winning. So in that case, because their preferred candidate is unlikely to win, you then look at the rest of the field and you go, okay, who do I like the most or dislike the least out of these candidates that are left that have a chance of winning? And most voters do not vote for their true preference. You vote for the one that you kind of like so that the one that you really don't like doesn't win. That lesser of two evils trap is a constant, constant effect in our elections. Coming from Philly, we had our mayoral race yesterday, this week. There were nine candidates on the ballot. Most people were not voting for their true number one choice. They were voting for somebody who they thought could win so that somebody else wouldn't win who they really didn't want to win. What kind of mental gymnastics do we have to go through? It's, it's nonsense, right? And we don't express our true vote, uh, vote, vote. Another downside is called the spoiler effect, right? This is what happens when voters who are uh, ideologically similar split their votes between candidates that are similar enough to each other. And that paves the way for a lesser liked candidate to then win without receiving a majority of votes. Two similar candidates can spoil an election for each other and somebody else who doesn't really have much support can skate through in that divided field and win. Happens a lot. So let's talk about one example of all of these uh, uh, negative effects here. His name is Dr. Oz. <laughs> right, so last year, Pennsylvania, we elected a new senator, uh, Democrat John Fetterman, and uh, he ran in the general election against this guy, uh, Dr. Oz. Dr. Oz won the primary, the Senate GOP primary, with only 31.2% of the vote, very far from a majority. And in fact, two, more than two-thirds of voters in that election voted for somebody else, not him, one of the six other candidates. He and the other candidates as well, they all ran hyper-partisan, toxic campaigns aimed at a small partisan base of voters because that's all they needed to do to win, and they knew it. And what's more is that in favorability polling, Dr. Oz, favorability polling is when they call you up and they say, here's the candidate, do you like them, dislike them, or have you never heard of them? And with Dr. Oz, with voters in that primary, Senate GOP primary voters, 46% of them disliked him, 40% liked him, and 14%, I guess, don't own a television. So the 40, he was disliked by more voters in that election than liked him. And yet he still won by less than 1,000 votes, even though more than two-thirds of voters voted for somebody else and more voters disliked him than liked him. Also, voters in that primary, knowing that there was a spoiler effect at play, had to really decide, okay, well, if I don't like this one, then do I vote for this one or this one or this one, right? There were a couple front runners in that race. It was very complicated for voters. They had to game out in their mind, okay, who has a chance? Who's likable? Who's not? Who, who can take down this one that I really don't like? These mental calculations leave people very frustrated. So let's, on the next slide here, we're going to see a ballot. This is what the Philadelphia ballot looked like this week. Nine candidates running for the Philadelphia Democratic mayoral primary. As we've said earlier, most general elections are non-competitive. Philadelphia is a one-party town. Whoever wins the primary is going to win the general. So this primary election was to determine who is going to be the next mayor of Philadelphia for all intents and purposes. You had a couple candidates who were very similar to each other, a couple moderates, a couple progressives, kind of crossover appeal between others of the nine candidates. You had a lot of similar candidates, so you had a lot of vote splitting. You had a lot of spoiler. It was just one big spoiler effect, this election. Everybody was spoiling it for everybody else. And the end result is that we had a winner who won with about 30% of the vote. That's not a mandate to govern. That is not a mandate to govern. As a Philly voter, I'm just left frustrated. And it's not even that the person that I voted for lost, it's that voters were bewildered and confused by the process. And it's not an accurate representation of how voters feel. 
It can't be. And also because we have a one-party town, this winner of the election won with about 30,000 votes or so. It's a city of 1.5 million people. How is that an okay way to elect somebody? It makes no sense. And one final problem here, I'm sorry, before we go on to the next one, is that in these winner-takes-all elections, you have a diversity problem that rears its ugly head every time. When you have a crowded field, the first people bullied off the ballot tend to be black people, people of color, women. Every time across the board, that's who gets bullied off the ballot. And so with this ballot, the first people to get bullied off were Derek Green and Maria Quinones Sanchez, a black man and a Latina woman. We've seen, and we're about to get into ranked choice voting, where there is ranked choice voting, diversity goes through the roof. When New York City Council instituted ranked choice voting, diversity went through the roof overnight. Where there is ranked choice voting, you get gender parity overnight. It happens within one or two election cycles. Let's keep going here. So okay, let's get into the solution. Let's talk details here. Ranked choice voting. Right, there is a better way. There is a better way to do this. Just like with gerrymandering, the better way is to not have gerrymandering, right? There's a better way. With closed primaries, what's the better way? Open primaries. With winner-takes-all elections, the better way is ranked choice voting. Ranked choice voting allows us, well, so ranked choice voting allows us to go in and rank our choices. Instead of saying, uh, this is the only one I get to vote for and whoever gets the most votes wins, you go in and you say, this is my number one, this is my number two, this is my number three, as many as you want to rank. And then you have an instant runoff that happens. So if somebody doesn't get 50% of first place votes, last place gets lopped off, and whoever voted for that person as their first place, the vote transfers to their second place. Right? And so that instant runoff ensures that you're going to get majority support it ensures that voters can truly vote their conscience. It de-incentivizes toxic campaigning and makes it so you can't just appeal to a small hyperpartisan base and skate through with 30% of the vote. Right? Ranked choice voting, this instant runoff system, it allows voters to actually express themselves and it allows candidates to actually run in a friendly, issues-focused way. There's one more phenomenon, this is just a side note, with ranked choice voting, you see cooperative campaigning. It's, it's one of the most interesting things where you have candidates who actually film commercials together and they say things like, Bob and I are both running for office because we care about education funding. Please put me as your number one, but if you don't, please put me as your number two. Then Bob steps up and says, yep, please put me as your number one, but if you don't, please put me as your number two. They shake hands on camera and that's an ad. I mean, can you imagine that? Right? Those are the ads that are running in, in jurisdictions that use ranked choice voting. Maine uses it statewide, Alaska uses it statewide, 26 municipalities in Utah use it, New York City uses it. It's gaining traction all over the state, and we'll talk more about it later. But it's coming to PA. So three ways, again, that, that we are divided and conquered here. Gerrymandering, closed primaries, winner takes all elections. There are so many others we could go into tonight, but time is a factor, of course, and we all need to get to sleep at some point tonight. Some of the other ones that we've all heard of, the Electoral College, 38 states don't matter, 12 states do matter, 12 swing states. The way that we vote for um, uh, presidential primary elections, who here has ever cast a meaningful ballot for presidential primary? Where did he live? <laughs> Say it again? 1972, it's been 51 years, <laughs> right? Because most primary elections are decided after the first four states, Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, Nevada. Sometimes it goes through Super Tuesday, but it's usually pretty done by then. Uh, the way we vote for U.S. Senate, a U.S. Senate vote in Wyoming is worth 46 U.S. Senate votes in California because California has 46 times more people than Wyoming. Right? There's all of these little subversions of democracy, these distortions that are built into our system that make our votes less meaningful, less impactful. They make accountability at the ballot box much harder to achieve. Not impossible, but much harder. Let's go to the next slide. So, to summarize, the diagnosis here. Instead of love your neighbor as yourself, the golden rule is the guy with the gold makes the rules. That's our system. 
We are stuck in a two-party, hyper-partisan system that locks out independents and third parties. It divides turf so it only has to battle in a small number of buffer zones, of swing states, of swing districts. It encourages toxic campaigning and writes off a majority of voters from the get-go. We have an idolatrous government of, by, and for the highest bidder and the party bosses. Bribery is legal. Legislators are often dependent on bribes to get and keep their jobs. There are definitely good ones who are able to inoculate themselves from the pressure, but as an institution, the golden rule is the guy with the gold makes the rules. To put this in the bleakest possible terms, let's go to the next slide and then we're going to start lifting up our spirits here. This is a Princeton study from 2014, very comprehensive Princeton study done by uh, uh, Gillens and Page, are the two academics. They looked at thousands of political outcomes from the 1980s and the 1990s at the federal level. This was an issue that came up before Congress. This is what the public thought of it. This is what special interest groups thought of it. This is what economic elites thought of it. What happened at the end of the day? And this is their conclusion. The preferences of the average American appear to have only a minuscule, near zero, statistically non-significant impact upon public policy. We do not live in a system where power is with the people. We just don't. That's the harsh reality that we need to face. We need to live in a system where power is with the people. Our lives depend on that. Our planet's life depends on that. Our kids' lives depend on that. We need to make it so. So let's go to the next slide here, and I'm going to ask you all to turn to the person next to you and give them a hug, if they're consenting, if, if that's okay. <laughs> okay. Let's go to the next slide, please. So please, as you're hugging the person next to you, please take five minutes and discuss these questions here. How does it make you feel to know that bribery and corruption are legal and systemic? How does systemic corruption and lack of democracy affect you and the people you love? And start dreaming here. What could our lives look like if we lived in a society where power is inherent in the people and our politicians were responsive to us instead of big money special interests? We'll just take five minutes and then come back together here. And then we're going to lift up the spirits and get moving on action.
in Italy, and they have a similar campaign window law, uh, 30 days for a small race, 60 days for a big race, and the day before the election, all posters, all signs, all everything come down, there's no ads, there's no campaigning, it's called a day of reflection. Interesting idea. Yeah. It's working. Um, I physically felt ill as you were sharing. Like I could, I, I felt like I needed to get up and go out. It was so upsetting. It's in one level to, Thank you so much, and that's a perfect segue into what do we do about it, right? As we started off earlier, it's not enough to be angry, right? And we're going to be bewildered, we're going to be frustrated, we're going to be disillusioned, we're going to be angry through this night, right? But the goal is to organize, because we're all drops in the bucket, but all together we're a wave. And that's what we need to get in step and become. So that's why organizing is crucial. None of this changes, everything we've talked about tonight, none of this changes because politicians are gonna feel bad about it and they're gonna do it because they know it's the right thing to do. They are the last ones to cross the finish line. Every time, for every issue, historically, politicians are the last ones over the finish line. They get pushed over the finish line by the people, by the movements, by organized people power. So let's get into that. Next slide, please. Woohoo! here we go. Okay, we are, we're gonna, so just to sketch out the rest of the night, we're gonna talk about who we are, we're gonna talk about how we join, and then we're gonna close out with uh, some words and some Q&A. We're probably gonna go till about 8.45. Uh, I hope that's okay with some folks. So much to cover. Who we are, March on Harrisburg, we are a statewide, nonpartisan, volunteer-driven, pro-democracy organization. Next slide here, we have our organizational chart. Just for fans of org charts, there's usually a couple people in every room who really love org charts. Um, this, this is ours. The people laughing, it's probably you. I know. So, this is our org chart. March on Harrisburg is our 10-person board, our three-person staff, our four regional chapters, and our dozen, uh, more than a dozen, uh, working groups. All together, that moves forward our four campaigns. Our four campaigns are Gift Ban, Rank Choice Voting, Pennsylvania Action on Climate, Poor People's Campaign. We'll talk more about them in a minute. First, we gotta talk about nonviolence. Everything we do is rooted in nonviolence. And please forgive this uh, uh, funny looking picture here where I'm making a fist in a slide about nonviolence. Uh, but that, that, that was a fist of emphasis aimed at our former governor. That was not a fist of violence. That was a fist of emphasis. Um, yeah, what a day. Nonviolence is active. It often gets a reputation as being passive. That couldn't be further from the truth. Nonviolence is active. Gandhi wrote, this power is not passive resistance. Indeed, it calls for intense activity. We are tenacious, we are relentless, and we are successful in our nonviolence. We force the encounter with the forces of corruption. We force them to see our humanity. And we generate a response of responsibility, sympathy, and service. And that at its heart is the core of nonviolence. All of our tactics stem from nonviolence, lobbying, marching, nonviolent direct action, leadership development, organizing, and everything else we do stems from the relentless pursuit of forcing the encounter with the forces of corruption. We have four active campaigns. Gift ban, ranked choice voting, poor people's campaign, Pennsylvania action on climate. Let's dive into gift ban. Gift ban, we have been fighting this one since 2017. Here are some fun pictures. Uh, that one on the left there, that was a 5 a.m. wake up call at the House Majority Leader's house in Harrisburg. He just happened to not come home that night, which is not uncommon with their uh, late night fundraising schedule. 
Uh, up in the middle there, that's just a fun one. We went Christmas caroling in the Capitol. We gave out a lot of coal, a lot of lumps of coal. Uh, that was a good one. And then uh, you see the one in the middle there, I'll just reference that one. That was uh, the Senate President's golf course fundraiser. Uh, we, we crashed that one and uh, forced the encounter. We have, over the last six years, we've conducted thousands of lobbying meetings, dozens of nonviolent direct actions, and we force the encounter with corruption everywhere, as you see from their golf courses to their Harrisburg houses, to the front yards of the Speaker of the House and the Governor, to the halls of Harrisburg, to their offices, to the House floor, to the Senate chamber, to the Senate gallery. We've been everywhere. We force the encounter everywhere. Let's keep going. There have been 35 gift ban bills introduced in the last 23 years. 35 gift ban bills have been introduced in the last 23 years. This is 74 yards of freehand drawn banner to the artist. That's probably, that, that should mean something. That's impressive. This was freehanded. Rachel did this. 74 yards across the Capitol steps proclaiming that they have failed for 20 plus years to pass the gift ban. This picture is from June 2021. Two gift ban bills have advanced out of committee in the last 23 years. In 2019 and in 2021, we moved it out of committee. Let's go to the next slide, please. We have to give a little civics lesson here to explain the progress of the bill. Who here took civics in school? Just quick poll, raise your hand. Civics, if you took a civics class in school. That's usually a very generationally skewed question. Uh, older folks tend to have taken the class, younger folks tend to have not taken the class because it, it continues to get cut. So this is uh, uh, what the pathway of a bill to becoming a law. For a bill to become a law in the Pennsylvania State Legislature, it needs to pass four votes plus two additional votes that aren't in the Constitution and then the governor can sign it into law. Those four votes that are in the Constitution, number one, the committee vote in the House, number three, the full House votes on it, number four, the Senate committee votes, number six, the full Senate votes, and then the governor can either sign it into law or veto it. But then there's these two votes in there that we have to talk about because they're real. They're not in the Constitution, but they're real. They're called the caucus votes. The caucus is when the majority party goes behind closed doors with no records, no transcripts, no nothing. It's secret. And they go behind closed doors and they say, okay, this bill just came out of committee. What do we think about it? And they have a debate, a secret debate. They take a secret vote. And if a majority of the majority says no, the bill disappears in caucus. If a majority of the majority says no, the bill's done. It disappears in caucus. So uh, next slide here, we have some um, headlines from the papers from 2019 and 2021. We passed the gift ban out of that first vote through the House State Government Committee, and then both times it went into the caucus room and it vanished. With no fingerprints on the body, it was dead. So the majority party gets their very nice caucus room on the first floor. The minority party goes up to a caucus room on the third floor. And I don't really know what the function of the minority caucus room is a lot of the time, because it's the majority caucus that matters. But it's the minority party getting themselves on the same page too, for whatever comes that day on the floor, they'll get in step. So uh, both parties caucus in both chambers, but really only one matters, the majority. Yeah. Uh, so, let's talk for a second about these votes. The hardest part of getting a bill passed in Harrisburg is not winning those four votes or those six votes. It's getting those votes to even happen. And the power to control those votes, 99.9% .9 of the time, is held by six people. Six people control those four votes that are in the Constitution. Six people control those four votes. The chair of the uh, House committee, the House majority leader, the speaker of the House, the Senate committee chair, the Senate majority leader, the Senate president. If any of those six say no, the bill is dead. That's how it usually goes. But, actually I'm sorry, let's go to the next slide here. So our message, well, our message to legislators on the gift ban is pretty straightforward. There it is. Pass the gift ban or get out. 
This is a banner we hung in the Senate uh, two years ago. Now, no gatekeeper, I'm sorry, four gatekeepers have emerged over the last uh, couple of years as we've been fighting for this bill. Four gatekeepers have emerged, and we'll see them on the next slide here. Daryl Metcalf, Mike Terzai, Carrie Benninghoff, Jake Corbin. These are the four public obstructions of the gift ban. And not one of them came back the next session with the same power, not one of them. And not one of them lost at the ballot box. Not one of them came back the next session after blocking the gift ban with the same power, and not one of them lost at the ballot box. Because of gerrymandered districts and unlimited campaign funds, they're unbeatable. But you can put them on the spot, make them answer for the unanswerable, which is their own corruption. Drive wedges within the legislature and drive them out. Gandhi used the phrase coercion or conversion. We have converted a bunch of folks. We've gotten the bill moved out of committee a few times, but these four definitely got coerced into retirement. Metcalf got kicked off the committee, recently retired. Terzai resigned abruptly. Benninghoff lost the majority and his position in leadership. Corman resigned abruptly to become a lobbyist. So let's go to the next slide here. So going through those gatekeepers, that's the way that most bills happen, almost every bill. But there's a way to get around them, and that's what we did last September. Because rank-and-file legislators, non-leadership, they'll often hide behind those gatekeepers. Oh, I wish we could vote for this, but what can I do? So-and-so, the Speaker of the House, they say we can't, so sorry, nothing we can do. So we pushed them, and we pulled out this rare legislative nuclear option, and we tried to move it forward and make the rank-and-file vote against their own leadership and basically launch a legislative coup on the House floor last September. The last time this maneuver worked was in 1921, and it, it's what ended Boise Penrose's political career. It broke his machine, and he died shortly after from a broken heart slash a heart attack. The guy ate 24 eggs and a gallon of whiskey in a sitting. He, he had issues. Our attempt in September, as you can see that bottom quote there from the press, uh, it was a clandestine plan. And it came up short because of intense pressure from both parties' leadership in both chambers. They came down as a unit with the hammer of Thor, and they failed us, once again actively deciding to not pass the gift ban. But of course, we don't stop. Let's keep going. <laughs> we never stop. This is what we're pushing this year, House Bill 484. This is the major action coming out of this meeting tonight, is to go lobby your local reps for House Bill 484. Bill Clinton here is going to help organize uh, these local meetings here in Delaware County and also spilling into Chester County. And Tom Buglio. And Tom Buglio. Uh, take responsibility for Chester County. Excellent. Excellent. So these are our two county captains here, Delaware County, Chester County. You're going to get a pledge card that's going to go around soon. It's going to ask you how you want to plug in. Please write in. I want to lobby my local state rep. We'll get in touch with you. We'll do a full training on another night. And then you're going to go in, talk to your state reps. You're going to get them signed on to House Bill 484, the gift ban. You're going to get them to make a public statement of support. And then our third ask in our lobbying is you're going to tell them to go talk to their leadership and say, hey, this is actually something I really want to happen. Because a lot of the time, we all saw this with the gerrymandering bill, they say to the public, yeah, I'm for it. And then they go to their leadership and say, please don't let this happen. Please don't let this happen. Okay, our next uh, uh, campaign here. And we're going to start moving fast here. Ranked choice voting. Ranked choice voting, we've already talked a lot about it, right? It's how you can rank candidates, one, two, three, and then you have that instant runoff election that happens, right? That is ranked choice voting. And so uh, ranked choice voting, as we've talked about, right, it uh, uh, decreases toxic campaigning and partisanship. It ensures majority support for candidates. It increases diversity and access. Um, and let's just watch a quick video here just to explain ranked choice voting in one minute. Politics is tearing us apart. And it's because elections aren't working for most of us. Here's why. In the US, each of us can vote for the candidate we like the most, but whenever more than two candidates are running to win one seat, it's possible for most voters to hate whoever wins. 
Because of this split vote, politicians can ignore the will of most voters and still win. Ranked choice voting gives you the freedom to select a backup choice to prevent that from happening. Let's say a group uses ranked choice voting to decide what to eat for dinner tonight. Each voter selects their favorite dish, but also has the option to choose backup dishes. If one food receives more than half the votes, it wins, just like in any other election. But let's get to dessert, where the competition is more fierce. What if no ice cream flavor has more than 50% of the vote? Under a normal race, vanilla would win, even though a majority of voters didn't pick it. With ranked choice voting, the flavor with the fewest votes is eliminated, and voters who chose that flavor as number one will have their votes count for their next choice. Everyone gets a say, no one wastes their vote, and the winner is the flavor that the largest number of people agreed upon. That's ranked choice voting. It's as easy as one, two, three. You get more voice and more choice, and that makes elections better for all of us. Those smiling faces. That's how we should be when we vote. Ranked choice voting, that is uh, one of our campaigns. And on the next slide here, we'll see just a couple working groups, ways to plug in. Um, oh, I'm sorry, we have this. Uh, right, ranked choice voting. It encourages majority support. It gets rid of the spoiler effect. It gets rid of the lesser of two evils. It increases representation of people of color and of women. It increases diversity. It decreases toxic campaigning and partisanship. And it makes voters happy. It makes voters feel like their vote matters. It increases turnout and engagement. Next slide. We give these feature, uh, uh, I'm sorry, these are our uh, four ranked choice voting working groups policy and research. We wrote our bill. It's going to be introduced in the next few weeks, and then we'll kick off a lobbying campaign for that. Social media, we're active on, you came because of TikTok. <laughs> it works. Uh, outreach, that's another working group. And then speakers and endorsements, we have a ranked choice voting presentation that, that we give all over. Uh, next slide here is our uh, Poor People's Campaign. This is one of our, uh, this is our third campaign. We are a member of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. It is co-chaired nationally by Reverends William Barber and Reverend Liz Theo Harris, and we fight to end the war economy, systemic racism, ecological devastation, poverty, and the distorted moral narrative of white supremacy. These are all very small goals. We join together to accomplish them. Let's go to the next slide. We, we can't do a presentation without showing a little one-minute Barber clip here. Uh, who here knows Reverend Barber? Excellent. So this is just a nice clip that kind of sums up what the Poor People's Campaign is about. It's from 2019 when we uh, testified before Congress. It is time for Americans to find out the truth about poverty for all Americans. The growing gap between the rich and the poor in this country is a direct result of policy decisions, not the immorality and the lack of personal um, work of poor people. Policy decisions made here in Washington and in our state capitals, but those decisions have been supported by well-funded myths. Corporate interests have sent their representatives here to preach personal responsibility and the danger of government intervention. But the truth is we must take a collective responsibility for the inequality, the unjust laws and systems created. God did not make us poor. Greed and abuse and power make us poor. I don't find anywhere in the scripture where Jesus said that it was Caesar's job to feed the poor and to clothe the widows and to take care of the orphans. He said, First of all, it's interesting that you always define yourself as Caesar. <laughs> that in itself is kind of strange. I mean, we need to stop for a minute to even hear that. Yeah. <laughs> We're living in the empire, folks. Or being governed by Caesar, and it's not supposed to be that way. It's supposed to be a government of by for the people. In the Poor People's Campaign, we fight forward together and not one step back. On the next slide here we have, these are all the groups in the Pennsylvania Poor People's Campaign. We would love for you to join March on Harrisburg. We would be just as happy if you joined one of the others. On this list, you'll see UU Justice PA, who have been incredible allies over the years. I think I've spoken in over 30 UUs across Pennsylvania. This week. <laughs> and uh, I'm not here to rank choice vote the religious denominations of Pennsylvania, but uh, <laughs> the UUs, UUs show up, y'all show up. 
and it's incredible. So please join UU Justice PA, join March on Harrisburg, join any of these other groups, we'll, we'll be just as happy. We all move forward together, not one step back. Our fourth campaign, Pennsylvania Action on Climate. This is a fun one. This is just a direct action oriented group that disrupts that intersection between climate and corruption, between ecological devastation and money and politics. This group uh, tends to crash fundraisers, disrupt that corruption, um, and uh, uh, this is the group that, PAC is the one that went up to the Pennsylvania Society, where Michael Badges Canning, the mayor of Cherry Hill Valley Borough in Western PA, stood in a swanky uh, Manhattan ballroom and called out, this is an orgy of corruption, and then shut the room down. So on the next slide here, we can only work on so many issues at once. We have four active campaigns. Gift ban plus ranked choice voting does not equal democracy. Open primaries plus campaign finance reform plus gerrymandering reform does not equal democracy. There is so much work to be done. This is our policy, uh, this is our, our full policy agenda, money out people and platform. You'll see on th things on there that we've talked about tonight, side jobs, revolving door, ending gerrymandering, all that good stuff. The bigger we can grow as a movement, the more fights we can fight. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Beth to, to talk about how to plug in here, how to, how to really get involved in a, in a uh, tangible way, please. Next slide. You can go to the next slide. So don't panic, organize. Take action and join us. Um, I know what we've heard from some of you tonight that hearing this stuff makes you physically ill. Um, for me, no matter how many times I hear it, uh, I get angry, um, I can feel overwhelmed or even defeated. And in my, uh, my personal life, I felt the real consequences of greed and corruption. Um, I have student debt that I'm paying back on a 30-year repayment plan. Um, and the divide and conquer strategy we talked about has caused divisions and estrangement in my family over issues that are designed to inflame and enrage us and tear at the connections that we have with each other. And what we really suffer from is greed-driven problems like our broken, uh, broken healthcare system. This us versus them trap is so easy for all of us to fall into. But through my work with March on Harrisburg, I'm learning how to work across these lines of division because the truth is, is that if we can unite, we can become a powerful force that can make real change. What we do at March in Harrisburg is empowering. We invade the private spaces and smoky back rooms um, of politicians and lobbyists, and I get, I get to look them in the eye, and I get to tell them, we are not stupid, we see you, we see your corruption, and we're gonna do everything we can to end it. And that gives me the energy I need to fight what can really feel like an impossible fight. But the fight is not impossible. It might be hard, and it might be long, but it's not impossible if we take action together. The truth is, is that if we don't root out and get rid of corruption in our government, we'll never see progress on any of the other issues that you or I care about, like immigration, housing, mass incarceration, gun violence, public transit, hunger, poverty, wages and labor rights, whatever issue is important to you. But together we can turn our anger into action that brings us closer and closer to a democracy in which we can all thrive. So I'm asking you, are you ready to take action? I want you to raise your hand. Are you ready? And say yes. <laughs> all right. So um, I'm glad that you're ready because no matter what your skills or talents are, there is a place for you in the democracy movement. Next slide. So, oh, yep, I mean, go to the next one. So in March on Harrisburg, we are constantly learning. Learning is essential to organizing, and as Reverend Barber says, there is nothing worse than being loud and being wrong. 
There is constant learning. It's part of our regular working group and chapter meetings. We do presentations and trainings. We connect people with our wider Poor People's Campaign um, uh, leadership development opportunities. And um, the struggle is a school. We invite you to become a movement leader who is clear, competent, committed, capable, and confident. Go to the next slide. So this is a list of all of the working groups, camp, oh no, I'm sorry, this is get organized. So at March in Harrisburg, we'll never ask you to do just one, to do just one thing, to send one letter to a representative or to go to just one event. Our finish line is democracy. You're joining a movement and together we take many actions to move forward together towards democracy. So you can join a working, uh, a working group, which just some um, of those are legislative teams, social media, art, March logistics, action planning, um, and then we have our ranked choice voting working groups too. You can um, join one of our chapters, which you see up there. Um, and again, this is the Delaware County, well, the Southeast, Southeast, Southeast chapter, yeah. I'm your chapter. <laughs> <laughs> so talk to him um, to join the, that chapter. Um, we can go to the next slide. And, and I'm just gonna return you back to Bill and Tom. <laughs> <laughs> So join us, <laughs> as the meme says. And I wanna stress that organizing is just socializing with a purpose. Um, it's building community and we need to organize, organize, organize. So we're touring across the state right now to raise up a nonviolent army to fight for democracy. And we wage peace. We need to wage peace with the same scale, duration, and intensity with which we raise war. So we ask you to jump into the movement and join us and we handed out the pledge cards so if you could fill them out and get them back to us we'll get you plugged into the movement um, and there's also um, a code up there and on your card to join slack um, slack is where we do all of our internal communications and we have a training on that um, if you're not sure how to use it but um, it's really where we talk day to day and our working groups talk um, so if you have questions about that um, you can ask Ask Andrea, she does the training for it. Okay, we go to the next slide. So these are just some of the, I think you already all filled out your your card, but these are some of the things you could choose from um, of different ways that you would like to plug in. We can go to the next slide. <laughs> So please donate. It is certainly ironic, but we need to raise money to get money out of politics. So we ask you to please donate. There's um, a donation box out front on the table, um, and there's also a QR code on your pledge cards, which you can scan um, and donate online. And um, now I'm gonna throw it back to uh, Rabbi Michael, and he is gonna close us out. And just on that donation pitch, just one more thing. Whatever you give to March on Harrisburg, give to UU Justice PA as well. Please, please do donate to both. Um, Bill, do you remember this picture? Oh my gosh. <laughs> this is April 2016 on the steps of the US Capitol building at the end of Democracy Spring, a 140 mile march from Philadelphia to DC to get money out of politics. There is the Statue of Liberty, a high school biology teacher from Wisconsin getting handcuffed on the steps of the US Capitol. And if you look over her left shoulder, you'll see me. There I am. <laughs> Liberty is under arrest. Democracy is under attack. What do we do? We stand up, we fight back. That's what we do. If you all have five more minutes here, I'm just gonna close us out with an idea, a thought, a powerful idea. Rabbis have been asking this question for a very long time, as have people all over the world for thousands of years. What does it mean to live a good life? When are we happy? When are we joyful? When are we in community? When are we in relationship? When are we there for each other? When are we responsible for each other? When does love happen? 
And those are very big questions. And one piece of that recipe, one piece of the, the, the puzzle, is the encounter. When we encounter each other, when we go face to face with each other, there is a response of love and sympathy that is generated. When a parent hears a baby crying, the natural response is love and sympathy and care. When a human being sees another human being in pain, when we encounter them, the natural response is love. The French philosopher Emmanuel Levinas said that when you see the face of the other, you are ordered and ordained to service. And forcing that encounter and getting that reaction of love, building that relationship, that's called nonviolence. Nonviolence is when you force the encounter and you generate a response of love. And that encounter, that nonviolence, is at the heart of what it means to live a meaningful life, to live a joyful life, a life of community, a life of responsibility. And there's things that prevent that encounter from happening. There's many. One is called racism. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel said that racism is when you see the generalization of the race instead of the particularity of the face. You don't see the person in front of you. You've already prejudged them. Corruption is another. That's the one we've talked about tonight. It says in Deuteronomy that a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the righteous. You just don't see, you just don't hear, you just don't encounter. The prophet Isaiah said that your rulers are rebels, partners with thieves, they chase after bribes, the widow and the orphan's cause does not come before them. When you have bribery, when you have corruption, you just don't see. You just don't hear the people. You get indifference. And that indifference translates to suffering and we fall apart. But nonviolence is the antidote to that. Nonviolence forces that encounter. It busts through that bubble of corruption. It pierces that shell of indifference. And it says, we're here, we're neighbors, and we have to love our neighbor as ourselves. It's the hardest thing to do in the whole world. But that's the challenge. That's the mission. And democracy is nothing more than systemic encounters, systemic nonviolence, a structure where we're perpetually encountering each other, communicating to each other through our votes, through our actions, through our words, through our debates, through our reason through our emotion, and we get a society of love, a society of responsibility, a society of responsiveness. And this idea of forcing the encounter of engaging in nonviolence, this is what the biblical authors meant by the word sacrifice. That's what this word means. The Hebrew for sacrifice is korban. In Arabic, it's korbanya. It's the same idea in Islam. And korban literally translates to the encounter to draw near to, to hug, to come close to. That's what a sacrifice is. And where do you go to sacrifice? Biblically speaking, you go to the temple. Anybody know any buildings in this state that are built like an ancient Near Eastern temple? Big pillars, steps that you walk up, high domes, gold leaf everywhere, marble floors, center of power and money. Does this sound familiar? Have you ever seen one of these? They got one in Harrisburg. There's a couple down in DC. And that's where you go to sacrifice. That's where you go to force the encounter. That's where you go to fight for your highest and holiest ideals. That's where you go when you say, I am a human being. I deserve to live. Everybody has a right to live. And we're going to work together to make that world so, that world of love so. And that's the mission. It's to build a world of responsibility, to build a world of love. And so thank you all so much for coming out today. This is an organizing tour. We're going to see all of you into the future here. Please fill out your pledge cards, hand them back to us at the back, get in touch with Bill and Tom. We'll get you in touch with Bill and Tom too. We'll connect folks and uh, forward together, not one step back. Thank you all.